good evening, everyone. This is uh, another episode of In Conservation With. Um, and it's a series of uh, Zoom webinars in which we, me, being me, uh, talk uh, to and interview interesting people within the world of natural history, ranging from conservationists straight through to artists, thinkers, writers, anyone that's actually involved in some aspect of natural history because you know what it's a, it's such a, a wide spectrum and that's why i'm so you know it's so exciting actually to have um someone like jack come along um and talk to us about one of the things he's well known for and i say that very carefully because even joe even though jack perks the man in front of us here is known by many as uh, as an expert in fish you are, by rights, a naturalist, aren't you, Jack? Yeah, I mean, we, we were having a quick talk about this earlier, weren't we? Obviously, you sort of get pigeonholed a little bit with urban birds, and I get pigeonholed a little bit with, with just fish. But obviously, I love fish, and I encourage that. But um, I, I love anything that, that moves and is scaly or crawly, or quite like the birds and mammals as well, but it's the scaly stuff that interests me. Yeah, Okay. Um, before we actually carry on, I just want to say that today um, this, this program will go on for an hour and then at the end of that period of time, I will say goodbye formally to Jackie, Jackie, to, J to Jackie, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting tired, to Jack and, um, and to you guys and then we'll have the after show party afterwards. And also I want to mention that we've uh, managed to get um, another sponsor for the uh, In Conservation With series and they are called King's Place Music Foundation. And this year they have a, um, a season called Nature Unwrapped and they decided that they wanted to, to, to help support um, the In Conservation Web series. So thank you very much for them. And of course, uh, Leica, uh, Birding and Nature. Okay, so Jack, um, just to give you a bit of background about Jack, who is when you're based, when you say you're based in Notting, Nottingham, are you actually were you actually born there, or you just live in Nottingham? No, no, I'm born born and bred Notts, and um, I live on. It's easier to say Nottingham, but I live on the outskirts of Nottingham, um, in a little place called Silverdale. But um, yeah, I've lived there most of my life. Good, okay, and you're primarily a freelance underwater and wildlife cameraman, working uh, for various uh, BBC nature shows like Springwatch, Country File, The One Show. Uh, the Great British Year. So many of you may have actually seen Jack around and about. I actually met Jack, I, I think I've met you a few times in the past, but I actually got to know you a lot better a year ago when we were together in Scotland um, for this nature writing festival at the Grant Harms Hotel. And I heard Jack speak and Jack is very witty. Um, as you'll find out later, he's a very funny man. Um, he's written two books, um, Freshwater Fish, Oh, freshwater fishes of Britain. Actually, is it fishes or fish? <laughs> I was hoping you would mention this because it's the ti The title of this talk is the fishes of Britain. So, if it's a group of the same species, it's fish. If it's a group of different species, it's fishes. Because I got I got so many people said you your title of your book is wrong, Jack. Like no, no, I checked this out. So that's the definition. So the collective noun for a load of different fish is fishes. A load yeah. of different species of fishes. I never knew that. That's one thing I've learned today. <laughs> it's great. Um, so you've written two books, Freshwater Fishes of Britain and A Field Guide to Pond and River Wildlife of Britain and Europe. And you've also written for many magazines, including BBC Wildlife and Outdoor Photography and Diver. Now, one thing I, I want to say before we actually carry on is that when you think of fish, and I think you've actually experienced this because a few years ago you decided to try and find Britain's favourite fish and you tried to get people to vote for a national fish. Um, when people, when he's mentioned fish, people think of either food or angling, fishing. Yeah. Um, no one actually thinks of fish as a legitimate sort of genre of wildlife to actually to study and watch. What's your answer to that? Do you think that's the case as well? Yeah, no, I do. It's it, like you said, it's either with a plate of chips or it's something that the fishermen can mess around with. And I think if you, so when I go to a nature reserve, because, you know, go, go to quite a few and I'll, I'll be staring over the boardwalk into the, a dike or, or, or the lake or whatever, and I'll be looking for fish and people will be looking at me puzzled. Like, what, what are you doing? Why aren't you looking at the, 
the turn raft or whatever. And I'm like, well, there's a, there's a pike in the margins or there's a shoal of rudder or something. And we go, oh, really? And it's right there, but they're not switched onto it. They're not looking for it. Um, and I don't see any reason why people can't do a bit of fish twitching because, I mean, I take it to the extreme where I'm jumping in the, the, the lake or whatever, swimming with them. But you can see quite a lot just from the bank. And, and it's amazing. You know, if the water's clear, that helps, obviously. But more, more people should, should fish watch. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting because when I'm birding, if I'm walking along a bridge and I look down into the water, um, I suppose initially looking for, you know, reed dwelling or waterside dwelling birds, but then you can't help but see fish. And, you know, just to watch them mur murking around in the water, you think, wow, you know, that's a big fish. I didn't expect that to be here. I wonder what it is. <clears throat> and I was talking to Jack yesterday, actually, and I, I was recounting um, a time when I was in Serbia and uh, in Western Serbia, we went to a very small river and there was this endemic species of trout there. And I was just enthralled. I took pictures of them actually, I must try and dig them out. But um, I took pictures of them and it was fascinating to watch these fish uh, moving around. But then you always think of fish, you know, you think of fish like goldfish, you think, well, have they got much of a memory? What kind of life they got? <laughs> uh, do fish have you know, have they got characters? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because um, the whole five second thing with goldfish, I think it's up to three months, goldfish can actually remember, and you can teach them tricks and they'll learn their name. They're a lot smarter than people give them credit for. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll go to the same stretch of river and you'll see a shoal of fish and some will be more bolder than others, some will be shyer than others. So it's, it's hard to say if they have emotions or not, but certainly they've got personalities. And I've noticed that, you know, some will be more bold and, and cocky so yeah fish fish do have, have characteristics to them definitely and i got a question from someone actually who's not here tonight um lisa from hove and she was saying to me well asking me what's the difference between between a fish that lives in the sea and a fish that lives in fresh water you know because she's wondering what adaptations have they made to actually live in those those environments and also how does a salmon do it or eel having yeah. both, you know, having living in both uh, habitats. Yeah, so, so, most, so most marine fish can only live in the sea and most freshwater fish can only live in freshwater. Um, it's to do with salinity, so they get used to it in freshwater, they can't go out to the sea and, and vice versa. But something like a salmon, which is andromenous, so they uh, predominantly, they breed in freshwater, but they live in the sea. And then you get eels, which are catadrom uh, catadromous, catadromous? something like that. But they breed in the sea and they live in fresh water. So I know with salmon, they have to go in the estuary first and their kidneys adapt because they squeeze all the salt out of them first and then they enter fresh water um, that way. But that's why fish can't just go willy nilly into rivers in the sea. Very few can actually do that. But it's a salinity issue. I think I'm, I'm right in saying that. OK. Um you, you've also have the accolade of being able, being the only person I think that successfully filmed every freshwater fish species in Britain. Um, yeah. How many species are there? Uh, it depends who you ask, but I, I would say 53. Some would argue 54 because of burbot, but I, they're pretty much extinct. But um, that's the great thing with fish. There could be some lurking around, but I, I, I bet my hat that they aren't, there aren't any, but 53. For argument's sake. Okay, Fran B has already got a question. So floods are really bad for fish then, she's saying? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, so for example, if we take this year, we've had a very dry spring and summer, uh, which is, you know, all right for fish. That's good for spawning, gets the temperatures up, gets some breeding. But when you get these flash floods, they wash all the fry out to sea and it kills them all off. So if you, if you get lots of flash floods uh, around about this time of year, it can wipe out year classes. Um, and you'll notice some rivers... Uh, you'll, there'll be, so when I say year class, each year the fish breed and you might have some fish that are really small from the year before, some that are really big and none in between because that's when there were big floods. So that's why sometimes you get these big differences in uh, fish sizes. But yeah, floods can be bad and that's why having a varied habitat is incredibly important. You know, like, you know, big thing at the moment with beavers, these beaver ponds create a refuge for, for small fish to go out and, and escape the floods. So yeah, it can be a real big problem. So I guess being interested in fish means that you're interested in, in anything that kind of lives in, in, in a sort of a uh, riparian habitat. 
Yeah, it's all connected, obviously, isn't it? There's the things, the things that eat fish, and obviously there's the things that fish eat. And um, you know, a lot of the time I'm filming fish, I'm, I'm watching waterfalls, I'm watching dippers, I'm watching otters, or or whatever. So there's there's a lot of other animals that I get to see that I'm very fortunate to see. I, mean, I get a bit blase with kingfishers because I see them so often, and it amazes me how many people say they've never seen one before. And I'm like, really? <laughs> But um, yeah, you, you get to kind of see it all, which, which I absolutely love. Okay, and um, I don't know if you're going to be talking about it later, but I just wanted to ask you about your vote for Britain's, is it national or favourite fish? It was, it was national. I guess it's more or less the same thing. I am going to mention it in my, okay. my little talk, so I'll save that for, for them. But, yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll skip over that. Um, let me find out, just before you talk to us about fish in more detail, okay. where did you spawn from in terms of your interest? Um, <laughs> um, it's a, well, I don't, I don't remember ever not being interested in wildlife. It was just always, that was it. I was awake and, and, and I was interested in, in nature and things. And it wasn't necessarily fish to start with. It was just kind of, it was probably dinosaurs to start with, like a lot of kids in the nineties. And then that evolved into reptiles and British wildlife and fish came a little bit later. But, um, yeah, I've, al I've always had a really keen interest in, Growing up with Steve Irwin, he was a, an idol of mine. I used to love watching his programs. Um, and I was kind of, I was, I was basically feral as a child. I just kind of was let loose and lived in along the river or, uh, you know, picking frogs up and climbing trees. And I guess almost the last generation to do that now. It's not really something you see as often, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I just love spending time, as much time as I can outdoors. And I'm, I suppose, very fortunate that I've got the job that I have. I get to live my childhood fantasy. So I love it. It's great. Um, we've got more questions here, actually. Um, yeah, okay. What are the rarest fish species in, in the UK, that uh, says, or asks Ed A, do and can you still find Xander in East Anglia? Um, so the rarest ones, I'll talk a little bit more about them when I do my actual talk, but I, I would probably say the rarest one is the Vendace, which is like, like a glacial relic, and they're a bit like a, a, um, a kind of a trouty, herony looking thing. They're not very remarkable to look at, but they're incredibly rare and they're on their way out really because of global warming. So I don't know how much longer they'll be around. The other candidate is the Alice Shad and that is a large uh, freshwater herring. And there's only a couple of rivers you get those in the UK. Um, uh, what was the second? Uh, Xander in East Anglia, is that right? Is that the second yeah. question? Yeah, um, can you still find Xander in East Anglia? Well, I know they were, I think that's where they were originally introduced, the Duke of Bedford. So the guy who did grey squirrels, uh, he did muntjac. He also did Xander and Catfish, so he, he had game. He was, he was a very uh, busy person introducing non-natives. Um, and he was the first one to bring Xander in. And there was a, I can't remember which, which drain it was. It was one of the drains in Cambridgeshire where they were put. I think they are still there as far as I know, but they've been spread all over the, the country now. You get them in the Midlands and um, in the Southeast, so they're kind of all over really now. Okay, and Phil Askey is asking, can existing populations of freshwater fish expand their range to other rivers if they cannot enter the sea? So basically he's asking, you know, how do, they, how do they move around? Yeah, so most of them know, but trout are one of the few that can because trout can, can go into the sea. So an example of that is that in, so I used to live in Cornwall, so I did a degree down there, um, and the rivers there were heavily... Uh, polluted by tin mining so really really badly polluted everything was killed off in them and then over the years the rivers improved and people started to find trout in them like well how have these trout got here and it's when sea trout have come up into the river they've spawned and some of those little trout have stayed in the river and become brown trout um, so that's one fish that will colonize new rivers uh, but most of the time if, if a fish is in a river or a pond where it wasn't there previously it's because someone's someone's probably put it there or there's been a big flood and it's connected waterways or whatever. I don't, I don't subscribe to the whole uh, fish eggs on duck feet. That's a kind of an, an urban, urban myth. I can't see that working. If, if you find fish in a pond, it's probably a keen fisherman's gone and dumped a load of fish in there. Which kind of begs the question, where do they come from in the, in the very beginning? How do, how mm. do you know, as the stittlebacks, how, how can they be found in so many different river systems in the UK? Yeah. I, where did that start from? Did, did all fish come from the sea, I wonder? Uh, but then even, even if they did do that, surely they'd develop into different species in different riverways and different... Yeah, river it, it's an interesting question, yeah, because they are normally isolated. I mean, I know... Um, I'm trying to remember my geography and history now, but I know, obviously, Britain was connected to Europe via a land bridge, wasn't it? And that was a huge, um, a huge wetland. 
So that's why on the east of England, you tend to find a, a greater biodiversity in fish because that's where the kind of old European ones were connected as opposed to the west. Uh, but how they got from there then to other rivers, like you say, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky question. Yeah, I don't know that. It'd be interesting to find that one out. I'm not 100% on that. Okay, cool. Well, I think um, maybe you can uh, infuse us with your, your fish. Okay, so I need to share screen then, do I? Yeah. Okay then. So for those watching, if you want to um, see the presentation more clearly, um, then you need to turn your viewing from gallery to share to um, speaker speaker view. And I think if you have any issues, my good friend Claire will uh, sort of tell you how to to do that. So can can uh, can you see that all right, David? That's all working, is it? Yeah, and um, by the way, if everyone else, if anyone can't see this clearly, can they just um, put a cross or a tick in their comment box? And I think it's under the reactions bit. But let's take it, but everyone can see it. Okay. Um, so yeah, obviously I've put the right the right fishes in there. So fishes of Britain. So this is a, a relatively short talk because I normally can waffle on for ninety minutes, but I know we've all got lives to lead, so I'll I'll keep this to a bit shorter than that. Uh, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the interesting pictures I've taken and experiences that I've had and some of the things that you'll hopefully find um, a little bit interesting along the way. So, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily a wildlife photographer and cameraman, and I've got lots of different ways of filming fish and photographing fish. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And I'll talk a little bit about those uh, as, I, as I go through the, the talk. Um, so this is one of the ways is just literally to get in and try and try and photograph them like that. But they don't always do that. They, they normally go on and swim away, which, uh, which isn't particularly, particularly helpful. There we go. Sometimes they're quite, quite inquisitive. And like when, when David was mentioning earlier, do they have characteristics? You know, some days I can enter the river. This is a pair of perch and they'll come right up to me to investigate. And then other days I can, I can enter the river and they're just straight off. You know, they don't want to know for whatever reason they're, they're not in the mood for it today. So it is quite nice. It's, it's, a, it's a hidden world that not everyone gets to see. And I'm quite fortunate because, again, I'm, I'm a bit kind of normalised, really, because I, I go in rivers so often, it just seems normal to me. But I forget that most people don't, don't jump in rivers normally. But it's, it's a great way. If any of you have never river snorkeled, by the way, it's amazing. I know, you know, maybe not the minute during floods, but uh, when, when it's in the summer and the rivers are clear and slow moving, it's phenomenal. It's great. It's absolutely amazing what you'll, what you'll find in there. Um, this is what most of us go out looking for. And I say, I, I love all wildlife. I love, love the birds and whatnot. Um, and it's, it's trickier because obviously you can walk along, well, just in your garden and you'll see half a dozen species of bird or whatever. But if you're walking along a river, it's a lot, a lot harder to see fish because they're not as visible normally and you don't get to see them the same way. So it's already a trickier battle particularly when some fish do have lots of lovely colours, but a lot of them tend to be a little bit brown and, and not as flashy as, say, say a, a kingfisher like that. So it's harder to kind of push them and get people interested, but that only really encourages me to, to try and, and showcase them. So, for example, this brown trout, uh, this is just taken from, from the side of the riverbank, and you can still see the colours along the flanks. Um, so if none of you fancy jumping in the river, you can still take pictures and watch fish, as I say, from the bank and get some, some nice pickies. Uh, polarizing filter is really handy for that because it just cuts out all the blur and you can get some some interesting views of them particularly around may that's when they're all leaping so uh, i forget who asked about the zander but this this is a zander so if any of you were like i've never heard of a zander i don't know what one of those is this is what they are they're a member of the perch family uh, and they're non-native to the uk they were introduced from germany originally they're, they're all over europe but they weren't originally here um you know like any non-native it, it would be better if they weren't here but it's incredibly difficult to remove an aquatic invasive species. You know, these things will have, uh, you know, 60, 70,000 eggs. How do you get rid of all of those? So um, they're, they're limited mostly to the Midlands. I think there's a few in the Southeast. So they're not all over the UK. Um, and they typically uh, just sort of kind of mix in with other things, pike will eat them and, and things like that. But they're quite, you know, they're interesting looking fish. It's just a shame they're not native. Uh, they but they've got... What was that? Sorry, David? They look beautiful. It's very the light. Yeah, 
coppery sheens. Nice. Yeah, they're really good eating as well. Actually, uh, they apparently they t- I've never eaten one myself, but they're meant to taste like uh, like sea bass. So um, they've got quite large teeth. So uh, as a predator, and they've got like a scabbard in the lower jaw. So they've got these two big fangs, and they fit nicely into the bottom jaw. So they look a bit like a vampire. And that's why they've got these big eyes because predominantly they're nocturnal. So you, they come out at night and, and grab their prey and they go around in packs. So they, they're pretty interesting. They are just, interesting little fish. Just out of interest, is there a difference between sea fish and, and river fish in terms of um, when you eat them? River fish tend to be more bony, I find. Is that a, a, a good thing? Is that a right thing to say? Yeah, they do. They, I, I think fish just tend to absorb their environment. And t- typically that's why we eat so many marine fish and we don't eat um, so many, so many freshwater fish. I mean, th- th- it's not. You can eat pretty much any freshwater fish. It's just most of them are pretty bland tasting. Uh, I mean, I've been, I've been to places like Hungary and, and Czech Republic before, and, and carp is really popular. Um, but it, 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 on its own, it's horrible. <laughs> I really don't like it. But they, they kind of mix paprika and spices, and it's and it's edible then. So I think if you mix stuff with it, it's not, it's not too bad. But um, it's not like a cookery show. I'm meant to be promoting these animals for, for what, you know, amazing behaviours, not how they taste. But um, <laughs> yeah, but there is a difference in taste, definitely. Um, there we go. So yeah, mentioning, mentioning carp, I mean, they are just absolute gut buckets. I think the oldest carp in the world is something like 227. And that was a koi carp in, in, in Japan, I suppose, not unsurprisingly. So they're very, they can be very, very long-lived uh, fish and, and, and vertebrates. So. They're amazing in, in that respect. And uh, carp, a bit like Xander, uh, uh, are not native, but they've been here a lot longer. They were here around about the 16th century and they were kept in uh, stew ponds in monasteries. So on the Friday, the monks would come out and that was their fish, Friday fish dinner. So carp have been here a little bit, a little bit longer. Where are they from naturally? Are they sort of Eastern European? Um, I think they'd be, I think they originated in Asia and then just over the years because they're, they're really hardy um, and they're easy to look after. They've just been spread all over the world. So I think Asia originally, then Eastern Europe, then Western Europe, then then uh, and here. So we mentioned uh, the bird vote, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you remember, but I contacted you about that, and because you obviously you did the bird vote, and I thought, well, I need I need a little bit of help with this, and and you were very kind in giving me some words of advice on that, um, and it kind of inspired partly by what David did, and just wanting to raise the profile of of fish i I did a a national vote to see what the the national fish of the uk should be Um, and i think i shortlisted a about 20 different species that got down to 10 and then spring watch were interested and they were like okay well we'll we'll announce the 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 winner live so that was a bit like okay well i'm normally behind the camera uh rather than in front of it but okay we'll we'll go for it so this was the minsmere series so this this is the same series that spinous cider stickleback was on which I often get connected. I, I didn't have anything to do. I like to think that I inspired them to do it, but I, I didn't actually film that. But I did meet Spineless Size. So I met, met a celebrity stickleback. Um, and we did that, and eventually the brown trout won. So if anyone ever asks, what's the national fish of the UK? Um, it, it's the brown, well, in that vote, it's the brown trout anyway. I don't know how a fish it would be counted as, but uh, that's what won. And I didn't mind that. They're beautiful looking fish. They've got fantastic colours. They're native. You find them all over the UK, all over Britain. So um it, it fitted i mean I, I would have liked the grayling to win but i think everyone knows what a brown trout is i guess so um it kind of kind of works in that respect and they're the most genetically diverse vertebrate in the world they come in the most shapes and sizes of any other uh any other vertebrate so that's an incredible feat for an animal as we were talking about earlier they'll go from one river into the sea into another river um, they're very quick to adapt and evolve so you get so many different shapes and sizes. So this is the sea trout, which is the same, a brown trout and sea trout, the same thing, but a sea trout is one that decides to go to sea. They eat all the krill and sand eels and they get much bigger. So you could have siblings and one could stay in the river and one could go out to sea and the sibling might only stay four or five inches. Uh, and, the, and the one that, that goes to sea could come back and it could be three or four foot, but they're from the same parents. So it, it, it's incredible how these fish can adapt. Uh, to live in that they take on a silver color which is better suited to living in the sea so uh you know and this is all environmental if there's not a lot of food in the river rather than starve they just go to sea so it's it's incredible really you know for for what is a, considered a relatively stupid animal they're not stupid <laughs> you think well, well let's clear off let's go go and get some food oh you're gonna let me uh 
There we go. Um, and this, this is a, another pair of sea trout. And this is when they've been in the river long enough, they, they turn more kind of traditional trouty colours. And they dig the red, they have a nest. So they've got nesting behaviour. See a bit of fungus on that one, bit of uh, stress from spawning. Um, now he, he, he courts the female, so you can see him shaking there. So that's, that's kind of like the equivalent of us strutting our stuff on the dance floor to try and encourage her to, to breed. And once she's dug that depression in the gravel, she'll deposit the eggs, he'll fertilize them. Unlike salmon, sea trout don't die after spawning. They'll go back to sea and they'll repeat it. They might do this five or six times, you know, whereas uh, Pacific salmon tend to die. Our, our salmon don't always die, but uh, sea trout, typically they, they kind of do a return journey. This was, um, this was actually when I was staying at the Grand Time. So this isn't too far from where we were staying, David, in, in the Cairngorms. And trying to film this sea trout and then a salmon came in. So they do hybridize occasionally. So you, do, that, you get all that thrown into the mix. Some fish will, will crossbreed with each other. So this is a male salmon with the same female we saw before and he was trying to spawn with her. So it does, um, it does get a bit kind of convoluted and, and mixed up and it can be tricky to tell them apart sometimes. Um, but I've never seen that before. That was a first for me. So superficially, again, they look the same. It's kind of a little bit like, um, what do birders call it? Like, you know, the little brown jobbies, warblers and things like that. There's like a, I don't know, six or seven warblers that all look incredibly similar to, to the untrained eye. You just say, oh, that's a reed warbler or whatever. And it's the same with some of these, uh, some of these fish. They look incredibly similar. If you're looking on a bridge looking down, you might not be able to tell the difference. But with a salmon and a sea trout, for example, one of the major differences is where the eye is. Again, and granted, you're going to have to be very close to the fish to, to see this. So I understand if you're just looking off a bridge, you're not going to be able to tell. Um, but with a, a salmon, the eye lines up with the end of the mouth. Whereas a sea trout, the mouth continues going, uh, the, the eye is more forward, the mouth kind of goes behind it. So that's one of the kind of quick and easy ways to tell. Uh, also, typically, trout are more heavily spotted. So if you look at the top, that sea trout is really spotted. Whereas the salmon, it typically loses a lot of that spotting. Um, along there as well so it's kind of subtle differences I suppose but you, you learn all these things after after years of looking at fish I blink and I see fish now pretty much um, this was for winter watch a few years ago and this was these little tiny trout in a chalk stream so again kind of showing the differences these are these are adults but these are only a few inches long as opposed to those which were a few feet and these males are fighting they're, they're kind of the trout rut they're smashing into each other they're flaring up and these are only a few inches, you know, it's incredible, really. Uh, all, the, all the time while this female is watching, and she's seeing which partner is going to be best to fertilise her eggs. So she'll start to dig the red, and then eventually again she'll, she'll deposit into this. So all these incredible, incredible behaviours that they have. Um, this is a rainbow trout. So this is more the thing that you'll be eating in, you know, your supermarket. That, that's pretty much what is going to be there. There's only uh, one or two populations of those that breed in the UK. The rest of them, the anglers fish for a triploid, they're all sterile, so they can't breed. So there's only, there aren't many of them wild, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, I'm always interested in trying to tell more unusual stories when I'm, when I'm working with fish. And one that sticks out to me is this, which is a very small, unassuming fish. It's called a bitterling. And again, this is probably about two inches long at most. It's not a very big one. But the way that it breeds is it has an overpositor that comes out and it lays its eggs inside of a living swan mussel. The male comes along and he fertilizes those eggs inside the swan mussel. The eggs are then protected inside the mussel and eventually uh, they come out as, as fry. So that the fish get free protection for their, for their young. The mussel doesn't get anything out of this. He gets bugger all out of this arrangement, uh, but it's a sim almost symbiotic. I, well, I guess it's not symbiotic because the mussel doesn't get anything, but how has that evolved? You know, it's incredible. How has that fish learned? to lay its eggs inside of a mussel for protection. Um, I guess because they're so small, they're vulnerable to predation. I don't know. But, um, Have many fish got ovipositors? No, not, no, well, globally, yes, but not, not in the UK. It's pretty much only, only, uh, only bitterling. So I don't know, evolution, I suppose, the ones that they protrude, they, they kind of kept along. So it's, it's, it's amazing, really, how they... That make them a bit more primitive than the other fish? Um, no, I don't think they are more. Pro I mean, I know globally there are there are lots of other kinds of bitterling, and there are other fish that that do similar methods. So, I mean, the, the funny thing is the way that mussels breed is they they their young attach themselves to fish's gills. So it's almost like revenge for the fish. They're like, well, we're going to get our own back and breed inside of you. But that's how swan mussels 
because often I, I, people will say, well, how have these muscles appeared? But the, the young muscles go inside of a fish's gills and then detach. So that's how swan mussels end up everywhere because they, they hitch a ride on fish. Um, and then this is a bit of, so the male bitterling are really nicely colored and they'll race around each other. Once the female deposits the eggs inside that mussel, that's when they all rush in and, and try and do that. So yeah, pretty, pretty, they're not a very common fish in the UK. You only get them in a few places. They're, they're another non-native one actually, but they're, uh, they don't really cause any problems and they're not, you know, there's not that many of them about, so it's not something that's of, of too much concern. Um, mentioned like mussels, this is a pearl mussel. So these are the ones that create the, the black pearls. I think Queen Victoria had some, um, but they're worth thousands, they're worth a hell of a lot of money. And these are a, a, a massive indicator of clean water. So they're not common in the UK, but there's a few in Scotland. Um, I think Cumbria's got them. Devon might have a few populations. And th these can live up to 120. So they're incredibly long-lived um, mollusks. But yeah, they create black pearls. And the only way that they can breed is by going inside of a, a salmon or a trout inside the gills, and then they detach along there. So there's all these symbiotic relationships uh, with fish and other species. And they'll just wait there, they're stationary, they don't move. And then when they sense a fish going by, that's when they release the eggs. And they just hope that the, the eggs go into the fish's gills. So a little trout goes by. It didn't spurt on this occasion, but you get the idea. A fish goes by, push, and then it goes into the gills. So all these kind of little mini dramas happening without people even realizing. It looks like a set of lips. <laughs> yeah, I've had other people say it looks like something else as well, which I won't... Uh, which yeah, I don't want to say either, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we'll keep it clean because it's not nine o'clock. Um, but my my favourite fish uh, by far is, is is the grayling. I absolutely love these. They are incredible fish. They look like they should be on a coral reef, not kind of swimming around Derbyshire or Yorkshire or places like that. Um, they're a member of the trout family, so they're distantly related to trout and salmon. Uh, and they're an incredibly good indicator of clean water. If you've got grayling in your river, and uh, they're, they're only really river fish, don't get them in lakes then you know that that, that river is, is of good health. So uh, I love it when I see those. So in Nottinghamshire, for example, we don't really get them. Our rivers are too, too polluted. We don't, we don't see them. But over the border in Derbyshire, uh, in the Peak District, there's a lot of grayling. It's a really healthy ecosystem for them there. How big are they? Um, they don't get very big. I mean, I think the British record is about four pounds. So, you know, on, on average, they're, they're probably, I don't know, 12 inches or something like that. They're not, they're not big fish. Uh, but they make up for it with the kind of the patterns and that, that big dorsal fin, you know, it makes them look slightly tropical. Um, and in the breeding season, they kind of take on different colours uh, as well there. So this is a male in the breeding season. The, the fin looks like a pastel of colours. You've got kingfisher blues, ruby reds, all those kind of mauves and purples. Uh, and that is to attract the female. But they also use that fin for communication. So people say, you know, fish talk, and that sounds absurd, but fish do talk. They use sign language. Uh, they'll also, uh, they've got what we call pharyngeal teeth and that's uh, teeth in the throat and they'll grind those teeth together and they communicate with each other. They'll let each other know if there's food, if there's a predator arriving. Uh, with grayling, for example, they flare the fin to, to ward off males and, and, they'll, and they'll fight with each other. They have like a grayling root. Um, these are two males here. So a bit like stags, if they're similar size and they can't decide who's going to win, they'll slam into each other, they'll bite each other. They'll push each other because they don't have teeth or claws. So the only way they can do it is pure brute, uh, brute strength, which is, you know, we don't, we don't tend to think of these fish having a punch up, but they do. They, they've got to do all these kind of uh, breeding rights and things. So uh, I love them for it. I mean, there's lots of fish that have behaviors like this, but grayling are the one that I spent the most time with, um, kind of most extensively working with them anyway. Um, what I really wanted to get was them spawning. I wanted to get spawning behavior. And this took four years to get, going back to the same location, uh, working out where they did it, what time of year they did it. It was typically uh, March, April time, finding the, the kind of better places for them to do that. And eventually got this male and female. And what the male does is he curves his dorsal fin over, a bit like a cloak, pushes her down into the gravel, and then they lay the eggs and fertilize them. So I was ecstatic with that, you know, not in a perverted way, but I was just very, very happy to, to get these fish. So. I contacted Springwatch and I was like, I've got, I've got these, these grayling spawning. I'm pretty sure I'm the first person to film this in the UK. Would you be interested in, in covering this? And I went, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Can you just get a couple more angles of that? And I was like, well, I can, but it's taken me four years to do this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had, to, I had to go back again and try and get another angle, which I did luckily. 
and this somewhat infamous clip is what followed, which I'll just let you enjoy without my narration. So the, the lighter one is the female, if you couldn't guess, and the darker one is the, is the male. And uh, that, was, that was shown live on Springwatch. And they, they, would, they would chuff with it. I didn't really, because I had my kind of science fish head, I didn't see the comical side of it. And then as I've rewatched really it, I'm like, okay, that is quite funny. Um, and I think, I can't remember, Michaela Stracker made some joke or something about it. And then the next day, the Daily Mail uh, came out with this, which was Fifty Shades of Grayling. And there were like complaints because it was, a, it was too raunchy. And I thought, come on, it's, it's like eight o'clock and it's fish. They haven't even got genitals, you know, come on. But uh, it was 2016, it was a simpler time. So, you know, uh, but that was great. That was quite funny to kind of see that, that turn up. Um, and it's great to see the adult fish, obviously, and it's great to see those. But what I like to see is lots and lots of, of babies, because you know then there's the successful breeding, because without the babies, without the fry, you're not going to get the next generation. So although it's tempting to focus on the big boys, it's great to see when you see these shoals of small ones. So that, that's the shoulder grayling, baby grayling coming in, along with the minnows and whatnot. So talking about the floods earlier with the year classes, you want to see lots of year classes, lots of different sizes of fish. What you'll often see in some rivers is just, just, just big fish, just huge fish, which you think, oh, that must be healthy, but there's no smaller ones because of you know, water quality issues or, or other problems. So lots of different sizes of fish is what you want to see ideally. Um, in, in a healthy river or, or lake. And trying to get different behaviours, as, as, as I say before, spawning is one of the most obvious ones. And a close second to, to the grayling as it comes in uh, is barbel. I love barbel. I think they're fascinating. These big whiskers uh, compared to me a little bit. Um, and I wanted to get them spawning. And the way that I do this is use a static camera. So I can't move it. So those two barbel have moved behind the camera and then they started to spawn behind the camera, which is incredibly frustrating. But then I was able to get a different behavior completely by accident, which is these grayling hoovering up all the eggs. So that shoal of grayling was following those barbel around and eating the eggs of them. And they'd learn, okay, well, we can get an easy meal here. if We follow these spawning fish. And you'll see this in lots of rivers that they've, like, this is a learnt behavior, just hoovering up the egg there. They know they can get an easy meal. It's also why fish have thousands of eggs because a very, very small percentage of those are actually going to make it. You know, they, some of these fish can have 100,000 eggs, but maybe only 5% of that might actually make it. So um, it's crazy. As soon as they come out of the fish, they're getting eaten straight away. There's, it's a hard life being a fish. I, don't, I definitely don't want to be reincarnated as a, as a minnow or anything in, in the next life. You know, goshawk or something would be my preference because something's going to mess with me then. Um, but yeah, it's great to get the grayling. Uh, spawning I, 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 this is actually the first year because of uh, the coronavirus that I've not gone and done grayling normally every year it's a kind of pilgrimage for me to go and film them so it's the first time in about seven years I've not filmed them so I am getting a bit of an itch I suppose I could now but they won't be spawning but um, yeah I, I, I did miss that that's one of the things I did miss quite a bit about being in lockdown was not able to go see my, my grayling um, it all evens out when I say about fish eating eggs though because those grayling were eating the trout uh, the, the barbel eggs this trout's eating grayling eggs. So they all kind of eat each other's eggs. And, you know, there's no one fish that particularly eats the eggs of all the others. So it's all relatively, relatively even there. Um, you know, David's known as the urban birder. I don't think the urban fish twitcher would, that would be incredibly niche. But I've, I have done a few urban areas and it's amazing the concentration of fish you do find in urban areas. This is in, in Birmingham, centre of Birmingham on the River Cole. And it was stuffed with gudgeon, loads and loads and loads of gudgeon, uh, which are sort of like the dustbin men of the river. They just hoover up all the little nooks and crannies on the bottom. Um, and our urban rivers can be a, an oasis for fish because typically they're a little bit warmer. So like London's got some great, you know, the River Lee, Copper Mill Stream, places like that, full of fish, absolutely full of them. Um, they're a little bit warmer. There's a lot of food that goes into them. Uh, and often you get less pressure from predation because... Uh, in most cities, you don't, you don't get, tend to get as many predators. So it's almost like a relief. So a lot of urban areas actually are, are full of fish. And one of the first ones to often kind of set up shop are these, which are chub. Uh, origin of the word chubby comes from chub because they're so greedy. They love to, to eat pretty much anything. And I've done, I've done this a couple of times now. I did it for the Great British Journal. I did it for Country File. But we were filming chub eating blackberries. Because when you think about fish that eat fruit, that sounds quite weird. 
but it's something that these chub love. They absolutely love blackberries. So in the autumn, in the late summer, if you're walking along a river and you see a blackberry bush overhanging, it's always worth just checking underneath because I wouldn't be surprised if you see a couple of chub and they're just waiting for the, the wood pigeons or the sparrows to drop a berry in and then they'll come in and hoover it up. But they love it. They love their five a day. They'll just be scooping up all the fruit on the bottom of the river, which is weird. It's something that you think happens in the Amazon with Paku, not, not chub, chub in Nottingham. You know, it's a weird, weird thing, fish eating fruit. Um, but yeah, I do some topside stuff as well. I'll, I'll photograph on the bank. This was in Victoria Park in London. This was a group of carp that was spawning. So I do do some stuff above the water as well, but predominantly I'm, I'm, I'm underneath the water. And this was in Nottingham Canal. You can tell it's Nottingham Canal because there's a Stella can in the background, which is a very typical sign of Nottingham. Um, and there was all these fish, loads and loads of them. There's bleak gudgeon, this perch, which caught a damselfly larvae and then scoffs it down. So urban areas, always worth checking out for, for lots and lots of fish. So how am I getting all this footage? How, how am I taking these pictures? Well, it's not just one, one way, there's lots of different ways. Uh, I use a pole cam sometimes. So this is a little monitor that's attached to, to a pole and surprisingly in a camera, um, and I can ship it out. So this, the top image there, that's in Regent's Canal, the bottom image that's in Liverpool. Um, and it's handy because obviously being in the water in these canals can be dangerous, but also if you're face down in a canal in London or Liverpool for too long, people start to ask questions, particularly if you're not moving much. So I've, called the, I've had the police called out before because they thought I was a body. And I had to go, no, I'm, I'm all right. I'm just looking at fish, which doesn't help the situation. People often think, well, well why are you doing that? So uh, it can be a little bit, a bit strange. But the pole camera just means that if I am in an urban area, it's a lot easier to just ship the pole out and have a look rather than me getting in. And often some of these waterways can be pretty, pretty manky and uh, there's vials disease and all kinds of horrible, nasty things that you can get. Um, so it's a lot easier to do that. So I do like the pole cam, particularly in the winter, uh, so I don't kind of freeze to death. Um, what I've kind of developed recently is putting a, a, a bigger camera, an SLR or, or mirrorless camera, something like that, in a housing. And that has a cable that runs out of it, as you can see there. Then that goes into my laptop. And then I can actually see in live, in, in real time, what fish are going by and I can get images that way. So it's unintrusive to the fish. And it means that I can stay dry and I can enjoy some Victoria sponge or a cup of tea or something. And I can take pictures at the same time, which is, you know, a win-win for me. So that's one of my favorite ways of, of taking pictures and, and video more recently. And I can get images like this where I'm not disturbing the fish and they feel more confident to come up to the camera. Sometimes I'll camouflage the camera a little bit as well. Um, I don't normally use bait. I always get asked if I use bait. Not normally because I, I don't want them to be eating unnatural things. I just want them to be, to be doing their thing. So that's what I normally, uh, normally do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about salmon just because they're such an iconic species and everyone knows what a salmon is. You know, if you talk to someone, you know, what's a zander? They might look a bit like a blank face, but everyone knows, knows salmon. Um, I've done a little bit of work with them, a bit of a bogey species for me, really. Because I, I, again, we don't, I don't get them commonly in Nottinghamshire. So I normally go up to Scotland every year to try and film them uh, up in the Cairngorms. And they start off in the river like this, this is when they're a bar of silver. So like we were talking earlier about them transi transitioning from marine to freshwater. And this is where the kidneys are getting used to, they're going through osmosis, they're getting used to freshwater. And the more time they spend in freshwater, that colour slowly changes from bright silver uh, and they turn to more of a kind of uh, tartan colours, I guess. And the end result is uh, some eggs. That's the plan. So they'll lay all these eggs that go into the gravel, they'll dig those in and then they'll hatch in a, in a few weeks. Um, I, I like to get in the water. I mean, this is November in the Cairngorms, it is cold, it is, it is freezing. There are, there are times where I'm sort of questioning my existence, like why am I sat in a river in November in Scotland? Uh, that, that smile is fake, I, can I was doing that for the camera, I was not smiling inside. In fact, it was that cold, my beard froze. I mean, I've got a pretty meaty beard, it was solid. It was just a solid lump of ice below my chin at one point, so it wasn't, wasn't ideal. But we, uh, I did get salmon in the end, these kind of beautiful big tartan colors on them. So it's, it's such an iconic, I mean, for Scotland in particular, it's an iconic species, but I, I love salmon. I think they're absolutely phenomenal. And the amount of problems that they face, you know, they've got so many issues with uh, climate change, overfishing, t you know, habitat loss, take your pick. Uh, salmon have pretty much got everything uh, going wrong for them. Uh, so I like to try and help them out whichever way I can. But I've done a bit of work with them over the last few years. 
And of course, if you don't fancy jumping in the river, salmon are quite helpful in that they'll leap for you. And there, is, there are a few spots where you can get kind of good leaping. Um, I mean, everyone thinks of Scotland, but pretty much anywhere on a river that has salmon, you've got a chance of them leaping. And it's well worth just hanging around in the autumn, you know, anywhere from September to October. And you've got a, a relatively good chance after rain of seeing salmon leaping. It's amazing to watch, particularly... Um, have you ever seen salmon leaping, David? Have you ever come across that? Uh, you know, I don't think I have. No. No. I'm sure it's something I would remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it's an, if you ever get the chance, if you're ever up in Grant Arms or anything around that time of year, it's well worth um, having a look. It's, it's an amazing spectacle. Particularly when they're really going for it, you might get four or five a minute just going for it. It's, you, you're kind of, um, you're rooting them on. You know, you see them going for it. Like, go on, go. <laughs> Try and get over the top. It's, uh, it's fantastic when you see one or two making it as well. Um, and there are fish passes that we've put in. So there are, on certain rivers, we've kind of tried to help salmon because where there are impassable barriers. I mean, barriers are one of the biggest problems with fish because we've put in uh, weirs and dams and things like that. And then the fish can't get to spawning grounds. So to mitigate that, a lot of these now have fish passes, which are where they can kind of go around them and, and get up. But a lot of them are a bit outdated now, so they kind of need updating. This is one on the Trent, so not too far from me. So we do get salmon, but not, not common at all. But this was one that was leaping in front of me. Um, so I put the camera down into the fish pass and it was knackered. It was, it was already at the beginning of its journey and it was already really, really tired. And this is the trouble because if the fish are spending all their time jumping over weirs, they're using up energy that otherwise they would use, you know, later down the line for spawning. So it can be a, a, another reason that they kind of get exhausted and, and die out, unfortunately. Um, when somebody asked about the rarest fish earlier, um, I forget who, who that was, but this was one of them. So this is the, the Alice Shad. So arguably the rarest fish in Britain. And it's a large, as I say, large freshwater herring. And you only really find them reliably in the River Tamar in Cornwall. They turn up occasionally elsewhere, but that's the only river that you really find them. And these are affected really badly by barriers because unlike salmon, they don't leap. So if they just get to a river and there's a, there's a weir there, they can't, they can't do anything. They might try and spawn below it, but that's not optimal. They like to spawn further up. So that's one of the reasons why these are incredibly rare. And these were the last fish on my, uh, on my list. So, you know, going for all the 53 species, seven years it took me to do it. This was the last one and turned up to Cornwall on the Tamar to try and film this fish. And the guys there were like, well, in the last six years, we've only had two. And I was like, oh, that's great. You could have told me that before, <laughs> before I come down there. And sure enough, uh, one, one turned up, it was, it was a fish pass. So they use it normally to monitor salmon, but occasionally shad get caught up in it. And you know, what are the chances? In six years, I've had two, I turn up one year and there's this shad in it. So they actually, they took all the readings from it. They kind of take a scale and they measure it. And then they let me release it. So it was quite weird because I don't normally hold the fish. I'm just filming them. But I was actually able to kind of hold the last fish in a seven years. It's quite emotional, really, holding it and then let it go. And it carried on, uh, carried on its journey. So that, that was amazing to kind of see that up close and, and get that shot. So I, I, was, I was absolutely chuffed to death with that. Um, I think my beard's a bit longer there as well. I've shaved it since and it's grown back. I'm pretty much uh, locked down beard at the moment. My head's on upside down. Um, the other rare fish was Vendace. So this is in the lake district that you tend to get those. And they, they were tricky because they live at the bottom of the lake. They're a glacial relic. And I was dropping these cameras down at night with a little uh, LED torch. And it was like being in you know, a blue planet, all this life down there, a little pike went by, a little tiny pike. But there's all these shrimp, there's all these little um, water fleas and things like that. It was, it was crazy, but I wasn't getting the fish that I wanted. And then, I got this clip and you'll see in the top left, you'll see a shoal of little fish coming by and they could be Vendace, but I thought that's not good enough. I can't have it where I'm like, well, that could be the fish I was after because um, they didn't come close to the camera. So I was like, well, I need to get a better shot. And eventually um, I got this, which was on a survey. There was a, a chap there who netted, uh, netted Vendace and he got one out for me. So I was able to get a much closer shot. But over the course of the seven years filming all these fish, it took a, you know, took a big toll on me, like both mentally and physically. I, I, I dislocated my shoulder at one point, spending a lot of time away from home with my, my partner. I mean, God, she deserves a medal for putting up with me. Like, so I'm, I'll hang on to her because I don't think anyone else would put up with, me, with it. Um, I mean, I, at one point, I even chopped the end of my finger off. Uh, 
So I was, I was uh, trying to film these Vendays and I was adjusting something on my camera with a pen knife and I, I chopped the end, yeah, my, my finger came off basically. I, I re they reattached it, but I can't bend that finger more than that. So this, you know, something to remember the project by. Um, and then kind of a little scar there, but yeah, it's my trigger finger as well. It's the only finger I need. Like if there's any other finger, I'd have just left it, but I need this one. So, you know, for photography, it's, it's tricky without a, a trigger finger. I just went to the pub, obviously, to nurse, nurse the wound. Uh, but the, these are the Vendace that were on that survey. So these were being taken back to be uh, dissected. So they're not, um, to say they're probably the rarest fish, they're not remarkable looking in themselves, but that, that's what they look like. I mean, obviously, I'd rather them swimming about, but it was much, dead fish are a lot easier to photograph than live ones. That's a kind of exclusive tip from me um, if you want to photograph uh, fish. Snorkeling is, is one of my favorites. I would definitely recommend getting in the water and, and snorkeling. As I say, I mentioned river swimming earlier. If you ever get the chance, you know, it's phenomenal. It's great, particularly in the summer. You know, some of the times I've been to Dartmoor and uh, the Peak District, places like that, just getting in, having a swim around, it's lovely. It's so, so nice just seeing all the, the, the fish and how close you can get to them. And it is amazing that sometimes you can, I say, get in the river and, the, and you can get so close. They're not bothered. They'll, they'll come really close to investigate you. Uh, like this is a barbel, for example. You know, they'll come in and have a look. Uh, not always, but occasionally they will. So it's well worth a go if you ever get the chance. You know, it's absolutely crazy. Uh, this was a still taken from a BBC Wildlife article. And you see this big perch, you know, comes right up to the camera. I don't know if it sees its reflection or, or what. I think it's, it's also how you act. If you don't act like a predator, they won't treat you as one. So if I was swimming around and splashing a bit like an otter, they're going to be off. But because I'm kind of standing up upright and moving really slowly, they're not going to see anything like that normally. So they, they just kind of swim around me. So um, kind of acting like that helps quite a bit as well. So these are some more. Perch are lovely. They're really common. You get perch all over the place. But I think it's often the common things we overlook. Like if you take birds, for example, if, if blue tits and robins were rare, they, people would rave about them. But because we see them all the time, they kind of get overlooked. And I think to a degree, it's similar with fish. Like with things like perch, they're, they're pretty common. They're all over the place. But if they were a rare fish, people would uh, maybe make a little bit more fuss about them. But I think they're great. They're lovely, lovely looking fish. Um, we've got some endangered fish, critically endangered in the case of eels. So European eels are probably slightly better known for this. So in the last, I think it's the last 50 years, they've declined by 95%, which is a huge decline. And we don't know for sure why that is, but we suspect it's something to do with the Gulf Stream shifting, uh, overfishing. There's, there's the, the eel mafia, which sounds absurd, but the black market in Elvers is huge. It's a multi-million pound business. It's absolutely bonkers for these markets in, in, in the Far East where they're selling uh, baby eels for, I don't know, they're eating them presumably. But uh, it's a multi-million pound industry. It's crazy. Um, barriers again, you know, water quality, you name it. I, I have contributed to the decline of the eels and you know look at this one all those scars over it that eel's got a story to tell it's incredible and yet it's still kind of soldiering on and eventually that eel is going to go from that little river in nottingham to the center of the bermuda triangle to the saragasso sea which is you know it's crazy this is an animal that could be living in your local pond or your local river and at some point in its life it's going to go uh, all the way out there i think it's a 3700 mile journey to go and breed you know that that's more that's over twice you know two or three times what a salmon would do and, and yet people kind of poo poo eels because they don't maybe look as nice so i think they're incredible creatures really really amazing um and fish can learn behaviors we talked a little bit about it earlier but for example we've got this eel on the bottom and there's these two perch shadowing it and it's a little bit what happens with moray eels and groupers on coral reefs but again this is this isn't a coral reef this is hampshire but this eel was going on the bottom, rooting around for food. And then you'd get little bullheads or little minnows darting out. And then the perch would come in and nick them. So that shows that those perch have learned if they follow the eel, they can get an easy meal. So again, not, not a stupid fish. They've learned that they can, they can kind of scrounge off the eel. So the eel doesn't get anything out of it. It's getting his meal nicked. But the perch, you know, they're quite crafty. So fish, fish are a lot smarter than people give them credit for. Um, and this, you know, out of the 53 species, there's so many that we, that we kind of overlook. I say uh, roach, I, I kind of liken them to the robin, robin of the rivers. Again, they're very common. They've got those red fins. Um, you sometimes get the slightly bigger ones. A couple of pounds is, is about as big as they get. They do get a little bit bigger than that. But most rivers and lakes have roach, and they tend to be like the bread and butter of, of rivers and lakes. Everything eats roach. 
So that means that you want good numbers of roach because that's what the bitterns are going to be eating. That's what the otters are going to be eating everything. So good numbers of roach is going to help higher up the food chain. So that's, that's another reason, even if you're not interested in fish, you should want to conserve them and help them because they're, they're so vital for so many other things to eat. You know, um, it's one of the things the RSPB have, have been doing in more recent years is they're managing their habitats, their reed beds in particular, to boost fish numbers because you're not going to get these iconic uh, species if you don't have if you don't have the fish for them to eat. So I think that's really good that they're doing that sort of thing. Uh, I do get surprises sometimes as well. So this is this is a sea bass, but it was inland. It was about 10, 10 or so miles inland, and bass can tolerate fresh water to a degree. So every now and again, I will kind of film things like oh, uh, and sometimes I get birds. I've had great crested grebes go by the camera and dab chicks and things like that, water voles. So it's always nice when you get those sort of things you weren't expecting. Uh, similar to, this is a flounder, you know, if you don't really think of flounder as a freshwater fish, but this was again in a river. So anything can turn up. And that's part of the reason why I love doing these remote cameras. So I'll place it on the riverbed and I'll just leave it for an hour or two and I'll come back and anything could be on it. It's like fishing, but not, you know, but obviously you're not fishing, you just thought, but you just don't know what's going to turn up. So I, uh, I really enjoy that. It's one of my favorite ways of, uh, of doing it. In terms of camera specs, I won't bore you too much with, with really in-depth stuff, but um, the clearer the water, the better. So this is in the Derbyshire Derwent, and with video, you can get away with this. It doesn't. It looks okay. It looks a bit moody with that. For stills, it wouldn't be any good, but video, it works. But typically, for underwater filmmaking, the clearer the water, the better. The clearer it is, the better the, the footage is going to come out. So if you take a river like this, for example, and then you can then go to this, which is the River Lathkill, which is a, you know, a gin clear river, really vivid colours. Um, it's much, much better to film in. But also the fish look different and they respond to their environment. So the trout in the Derwent are quite muddy and dull looking. The trout in, uh, in the Lathkill look like they've been painted for an oil painting. They're incredibly beautiful, really vivid red spots and, and a kind of buttery uh, belly on them. So, you know, they, they respond to their habitat. But clear water works works far better for uh, underwater filming, unsurprisingly. Um, I scuba dive quite a bit as well. Um, not, not so much recently, but over the last few years, I've done it quite a lot. Um, and that's obviously you're completely submerged into their environment and you can kind of uh, get some better kind of habitat shots and things like that, particularly things like pike, uh, which are one of my favorites to work with. And I wanted to get shots of pike uh, breeding because pike, again, have that sort of uh, persona of being predatory and attacking things you know dragging away children in yorkshire terriers and things like that when the reality is that pike can be quite caring uh parents really so you'll get two of them like here rubbing up against each other females are much bigger so the males are about half the size so she could turn around and eat them if she wanted to and they are cannibals pike eventually she'll go into the weeds she'll lay her eggs the male will caress her to encourage the egg laying and then he'll fertilize the egg. So I like that because pike have this, you know, this, pred this predatory nature, and yet they've got a slightly more tender, tender side to them. I'm still yet to see one nail a duck. I'd love to see it, and not in a horrible way, but I'd love to see one go for a duckling. I know, I know I've had other people tell me that, but that would be a cracking photo uh, to see one go for it because they do eat them. Um, and comparing behaviors topside. So this is a pike, and it's being mobbed by smaller fish, just like you would see small birds mob a bird of prey, like buzzards and, and you know songbirds and whatever. So those fish know that the safest place to be with that pike is behind it. They don't want to be anywhere near the front. And the pike knows, well, once those fish have seen me, there's no point in me hunting for them because they already know I'm here, I'm not going to catch one. So pike rely heavily on being an ambush hunter. That's why they're, they're the shape that they are. That's why they're the color that they are because they'll hide in the weeds. And then when a fish goes by, bam, they'll just go in and smash it. Um, so, you know, in incredible speed on the pike as well. We've got some really weird fish as well, really primitive fish. I mean, lamprey, for example, there's three species in the UK. Um, and lamprey are so primitive, in fact, that a salmon is more closely related to us than it is a lamprey. That's how far apart they are. Lamprey are so primitive, they don't even have a jaw. That's just a round mouth. That's all they've got. They can't, they can't shut their mouth. And... Of the three species, two of them are parasitic. They feed on the blood of other animals. They go out to sea and they feed on dolphins, basking sharks, seals, things like that. And then when they're, they're done after a few years, they make their way back into rivers and, and, and they spawn. So a bit like salmon and trout. So these are two sea lamprey.
and they'll dig that depression and lay the eggs. But they're quite rare. You're lucky to see lamprey. They're not a common, common fish anymore. Um, I forget which king it was. I think it was King Henry the first, first or third. And he died from eating too many lamprey. It was a, a surfeit of lamprey, apparently. I mean, it was probably something else, but I like to think that the lamprey did it in for him. But, you know, not many fish can say that they've done that. And this is a, to show you what the kind of damage they can do. So uh, that, that's the hole in the side of a sea trout where a lamprey has come in and took a chunk out of it. And there aren't really any documented attacks in, in the UK, but in the Great Lakes in America, they have a real problem with lamprey attaching to swimmers. So, you know, it's not something you would uh, want taking a chunk out of you. So predominantly I'm in the water with fish, but I do also do some, some other stuff. I do tank photography, which might seem a little bit weird. You think, well, why would you bother doing that? Well, it's a great way to get close up macro shots, but also if, the, say like now the rivers are in flood, I can't do any underwater photography because the, the water's too murky. But I can, if I've got a little tiddler now, I can scoop up some small fish. I can put them in a tank, sometimes on location, sometimes I'll bring them home, and I can take pictures that way. So it means I can keep busy even if I can't get in the river. And it's amazing the detail that you can get in these sort of images. So like with this one, if you didn't know that was done in a tank, you probably wouldn't have guessed that. So it's quite nice that you can get these really detailed up close macro images that would be really, really difficult uh, in the wild and the fish is none the worse you release the fish after um, you know they're, they're, they're completely fine with it so you can get some really good images particularly the small guys you know minnows uh, sticklebacks bullheads all that kind of stuff they can come out really really good in this this tank photography setup in terms of actual cameras that I use there's so many on the market um, I'm not sponsored by any of these I'm going to sound like I am but I'm not uh, GoPros are, are pretty decent you know for what you pay I mean I always think there are cheaper cameras than GoPros. You, you can get a kind of GoPro knockoff of 40 quid, but the, the footage will be like a potato. It will be actually rubbish quality. And you can get cameras that are maybe twice as good, but then it's, it's starting to get silly money. So GoPro is kind of middle of the road. It's not too badly priced and the quality is all right. So that's what I would recommend if you wanted to kind of have a go at some of this underwater stuff. And I've tried to be inventive. This is fish cam. Um, does it make any difference? Probably not. No, I don't think the. But you know, it, it makes it puts a smile on my face. And sometimes the fish will come in close to investigate. So it's just kind of in, in kind of looking at different ideas. Uh, but it's always worth a go. Why not? You know, we've probably been watching too much uh, Spy in the Hood or whatever. It's that kind of David Tennant program. I can't remember what it's called now, but where they make the animals. I've been watching too much of that. Um, but predominantly, I've got a camera, uh, a Nikon, and a Panasonic, or what I use. And then they go into the case. So the camera itself is not waterproof. It goes into the housing and then it's, that's how it's waterproof. And you're not limited in any way in how you can take those pictures. You can still uh, take every single photo and every kind of settings on that camera while it's in the housing. So that's really, really useful. But predominantly, we only really do macro and wide angle underwater. You wouldn't use a great whopping, you know, 600 mil lens uh, underwater. That would be completely useless because underwater, you need to focus really close to the subject uh, normally. So that's why wide angle and macro are the only two that normally we use. And I look in my lifetime. So when I started this, when, when did I start? 2012 is when I left university. So I guess that's the start of my career. And this is the very first GoPro. And I remember at the time, I thought this was Blue Planet. I was like, this is amazing. I'm really, really happy with this. Look, at, look I can see shapes, <laughs> I can see movement. This is amazing. Um, and obviously look back at it now, it's bloody awful. But it's, it's amazing how technology has advanced. In, I mean, I guess it's nearly 10 years. I oh know. Well, a bit less than 10 years, eight years. And technology has advanced incredibly since then. And this, this, is a, this isn't even the latest GoPro. This is just a couple of models up. And already it's got a lot sharper. The colors look better. I mean, if I showed you the latest one, it'd look even better than this. So it's definitely a lesson for me. Uh, that I need to keep updating technology. Like if you're if you if you're into your photography, for example, then you want to kind of keep keep doing new new cameras because it will it will make a difference for the sort of shots that you do. Um, so I'm coming towards the end of this anyway, but I'm just going to mention a couple more things. Um, it's interesting how photography and filmmaking is now being used to help conservation. In that, all those little depressions that you see in the gravel there, all those white patches, they're salmon reds, and by using a drone you can count all of those reds and you can estimate how many salmon are in the river. Now, before it would have involved someone walking up and down the river for miles, kind of looking like that and trying to count them. 
And it, I mean, that was as accurate as you could be before, but now you can just send one person with a drone and you can be 100% sure how many reds there are. I mean, you can even see fish sometimes. Um, so it's revolutionized the way that we survey fish by using a drone, which sounds kind of silly, but that's, that's how they do it. Um, and you can also, you know, put a, a, a camera down and, and film fish that you maybe didn't know were there. I've done a little bit of work with plastics. I did some work for Greenpeace last year, uh, all the way from, you know, invertebrates in the river with microplastics in them to fish interacting with bags, birds putting it in their nests. So it was quite sad, really, the amount of plastic in, in some of our rivers. I think people are more switched onto it now. Like, I don't see as much as I used to, but there are still... Uh, still a few kind of problems and normally after a flood that's when you get a lot of plastic because it gets washed in off the riverbanks that's when they tend to be be full of it but you can see some horrific sites it can be quite um quite sad really when it's kind of choked up but it's just one of those things that uh, is kind of slowly being addressed uh, i i suppose but anyway that brings me to the end of of that hopefully that's kind of given you something to think about and um hopefully you enjoyed that Jack, that was pretty amazing to see such a selection of species and also the work that you've done uh, in order to, uh, to, to obtain those images. I mean, to actually go and spend seven years of your life and risk life and limb, literally, <laughs> yeah. uh, to try and capture those images um, is, is commendable. And I think you singularly have done a lot uh, to you know, improve the appreciation of fish um, as uh, an animal worth studying as opposed to just um, hooking out of the water or eating. So you've done very well. No, thanks, David. That's, that's really nice of you to say. Um, okay, so listen, we are over an hour now. So what I'd like to do is um, just want to ask you a couple of questions before we go into our little after show party bit. Okay. Um, and then if you have any questions, Zoomers, you can ask the questions after then, if you can stick around for another 10 minutes after the end of this particular episode. So, Jack, we haven't talked much about birds, but what is your favourite bird? My favourite bird? Do you want me to come out of share, uh, share screen as well also? Or do you want me to yeah, leave? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll just try and do okay. that. Let's see your face. Oh, can you see me? I've lost you now. I can see you. I've just got my... Uh, Oh, it's because, yeah, because I'm sure, there we go. Sorry, <laughs> Tech, it's bad, isn't it? I'm a photographer and I don't know how to use technology. Um, so my, my favourite bird, um, for me, it's the Great Crested Grebe. I, I, I think they're phenomenal, absolutely beautiful birds. Very fortunate that here in, in the Midlands where I am, they're, they're pretty common. So I, I, I'm yet to see the dance. I've, have you ever seen that? Have you seen the mating dance? Yeah. Have you? Oh. Even in London. Really? I envy that. I'd love, I've seen the lead up, I've seen the flirting, but I've not seen the full eruption I, I yeah it's one of my bucket list wildlife things i'd love to see that there's websites where you can watch that oh is there <laughs> what is your favorite amphibian um globally it, it, it'd probably be the giant salamander i mean the these uh, i think they're in china but these things are like four foot long great big salamander i mean absolutely incredible kind of primordial looking thing if it was the UK, it'd probably be the Great Crested Newt, just because anything Great Crested apparently is my uh, my favourite thing. But yeah, Great Crested Newts are really, really uh, amazing creatures. And I guess you, you have a favourite fish. I do. Great, great <laughs> grayling. So not quite Great Crested grayling, but um, yeah, great grayling are phenomenal. As I, as I mentioned in the talk, just the way that they look, the fact that they're kind of a great indicator for river health. Um, they're amazing creatures. Absolutely love grayling. So I've had a, I mean, I love all fish. I could, you know, I could talk for another hour about them, which I, I won't, but I, I, I think they're amazing. I do like my grayling. And uh, notwithstanding the COVID-19 pandemic, if you could be anywhere on this planet right now, where would you be? Well, I've not, I've not done a lot abroad really. Um, and I, and I, cause I love the UK and, and that's what I've kind of focused on. But if, if I could be anywhere doing anything, um, I'd love to go somewhere like New Zealand. Some, some of their rivers are phenomenal. Uh, they've got, you know, uh, I forget the name of the species, but they've got a giant crayfish, really, it's the size of a lobster, huge, big thing. Um, really clean rivers, a uh, big, big trout there, which uh, we, we introduced actually, where we kind of, British Empire took trout over for fly fishing and they kind of spread out there. But um, New Zealand would be amazing, that would be good. If it, if it was the UK, um, 
then probably Scotland, which hopefully, you know, when, if things relax, I'll, I'll get up there and do a little bit of work uh, sooner rather than later. Good. Fantastic. Um, Zoomers, just to let you know, next week um, on Monday, we've got Matt Merritt, same time, 7 p.m. BST. Matt Merritt's the editor of Birdwatching Magazine, and he'll be talking about um, editing Birdwatching Magazine. Tuesday, we have Edward Mayer, who is all about swifts. He's talking about swift conservation. Wednesday night, myself and Caroline Lucas will be here. Caroline Lucas, CMP for the Green Party. We'll be talking about diversity and our relationship with nature during the coronavirus pandemic. And on Thursday, we have um, this guy called Silas Ol Olofsson, who's from the Faroe Islands. He's actually in Mongolia, and he's been finding some really amazing birds for Mon Mongolia, and he's going to be talking about birds in Mongolia. So this is a point where I have to say to Jack, you have been absolutely eye-opening and fantastic, and it's really interesting learning so much about the fish of Britain and, you know, I certainly, for one, will be looking at them um, through different eyes, really. No, yeah, well, thanks for asking me on, David, as well. And, yeah, hopefully people have learned a little bit about fish. So, yeah, happy to be here. And, uh, well, we'll carry on in, uh, in a minute. But thank you also for the Zoomers for coming tonight. And I hope that we will see you again um, some other day on another uh, In Conservation With episode. And please take care and don't forget, keep looking up, but also look down for the fish. <laughs>